In this part, I will explain how the Aztec policies play out over the course of the decades to come. The Aztec Empire, after Moctezuma I, remained largely unchanged in many of its policies. From this moment forward, emperors would be mostly concerned with warfare to expand their empire. But why was the Aztec Empire always at war? Well, in order to explain exactly why the Aztecs needed to expand, we need to look at the four classes of citizens in the Aztec culture. The warrior, the commoner, the noble, and the priest. Each of these classes had become dependent on an expansionist Aztec empire, and in turn, the Aztec empire was dependent on these four classes in order to expand. First, the warrior class. Warriors had three functions in the empire to intimidate anyone inside the empire to stay loyal to the empire, to put down any rebellion that might emerge, and to conquer new territories. But in return, skilled warriors would receive land in exchange for their military service. Because the Aztec were feudalistic, only very few people were allowed to own land. Commoners worked on the land that belonged to the nobles, priests, or skilled warriors. But here's the problem with that. You need warriors to make sure the empire doesn't fall apart. But eventually, you run out of land to give to your warriors. So you need new land to give to new warriors. But while the Aztec Empire looked big on a map, only a small amount of the land was actually suitable to live on. After all, you need to be close to a fresh water source and other people who can create all the creature comforts a retired warrior wants. And if you needed such land, you almost always had to take it from somebody else. To make sure the Aztecs maintained their current territory, they would need to conquer new territory. Secondly, there are the commoners. While they were by far the least privileged, they were the most populous and produced the most goods and services in the empire. And the more tribute was sent to Tenochtitlan and its colonies, the more their population expanded. After all, there wasn't any plague like in Afro-Eurasia to keep the population in check. But now, the Aztecs needed more tribute so that people would have enough food, enough tools, and enough other products to maintain their relative comfortable lifestyle. And keep in mind that back in the 15th century, roughly 99% of your population worked in agriculture just to feed the population. So the Aztec Empire needed to expand quickly in order to maintain the lifestyle of their current population. This expansionism meant more commoners would be able to be born, meaning the empire needed to expand further and faster. Third is the noble class. They were rulers and as a result were very rich. And they liked being rich. So as the empire grew, so did the wealth of the nobles. And so the nobles were very interested in assuring the Aztec kept expanding for their own gain, to maintain the empire, and to prevent a communist revolt if they were to run out of supplies. As a result, they would put someone on the throne who was focused on growing the empire. The current emperor, Moctezuma, and the previous emperor, Itzcoatl, were the greatest reformers of the Aztec empire while the empire was still young and malleable. But after them came a string of rulers who had more brawn than brain, all put in place by these nobles. Such emperors were easier to control and they were good for expansion, so the nobles loved this system, eventually making them very corrupt. And lastly the priests, the bloodthirsty priests who'd like to eat others' hearts out. And the priests were not proactively favoring expansion, Rather, they were highly reactionary. As the empire expanded, the priests demanded more human sacrifices for their gods. This made sense. In war, the Aztecs would bring back captured enemy soldiers and then ritually sacrifice them. In fact, a soldier wasn't promoted based on their ability to lead people or kill people. They were promoted depending on how many enemies they captured. They would be granted knighthoods and privileges, depending on how many soldiers they personally captured. So as the Aztecs waged more wars, the priests expanded their sacrificial activities. And so, combining all of this, we can conclude that the expanding empire needed to expand 
in order to meet the needs of the expanding empire. And this social system worked quite well for the Aztecs at first. Motokazuma had encountered a fledgling empire, and when he died in 1469, he left it a major powerhouse in Mesoamerica. He was succeeded by his son, Axayacatl. Axayacatl's reign included large military expansions, but he was never able to surpass his father. Axayacatl also faced conspiracies to remove him and his council of nobles from power, and so he sent an army to completely crush the rebels which sent a message to anyone else who thought he might be weak. And to restore his reputation, he decided to wage war against the Tarsakan state. The Tarsakan were a civilization like the Aztecs with a feudalistic government system. They were unique in that they made weapons made of bronze, something the Aztecs never developed. In the ensuing war, the Aztec army of 24,000 warriors was almost completely wiped out. From now on, the Tarsakan state would prevent any Aztec expansion east or northeast. In fact, the Tarsakan state was so successful that it would outlive the Aztec empire. And this was also the first time that two Mesoamerican states clearly defined their territory, something that was always a loose concept for them with large parts of no man's land between various states. Axayacatl would desperately try to regain his reputation. But instead, all his military campaigns after this were failures. And now an interesting question comes up. When people are loyal because they fear your army, what happens when your army loses a war? Well, after various city-states received the news that their emperor wasn't a strong general, many decided to rebel. And so, over the coming years, more and more rebellions popped up that needed to be put down. This put further strain on the Aztec military capabilities, as they still needed to expand or else their empire would implode, but also needed to divert troops from the front lines to put down rebellions. Upon his death in 1481, Axayacatl left the empire in a state of upheaval and weakness. He would be succeeded by the most incompetent leader in all of Aztec history, his brother Tizoc. Tizoc embodied everything that was wrong with the Aztec Empire. For example, when Tizoc ascended the throne, he decided to put down a rebellion to show his power. So he decided to make an example of a small town. This should be an easy victory. The Aztec army versus a small town. The Aztecs had defeated countless other towns. But Tizoc lost this easy battle against a minor town. And out of the whole campaign, he gained only 40 prisoners. Tizoc was unskilled in battle, indecisive, and had no interest in military expansion. He would soon die under suspicious circumstances, most likely poison. Tizoc was succeeded in 1486 by a man who was the exact opposite of him. A man named Awitsoro, the youngest son of Emperor Matukuzoma. He developed new military strategies and expanded the empire's reach from the Caribbean Sea all the way to the Pacific Ocean. He managed to quell many rebellions, but new ones would always keep popping up. As the empire expanded, new subjects became new potential rebels. But he is best remembered for the completion of the Grand Temple in the center of Tenochtitlan, the one started by Motokazuma I. An event that is infamous even today and is in fact the very reason why I wanted to make this series in the first place, so I could animate this. The entire empire was invited to join the opening, from the lowest slave to the highest noble, and anybody living in Tenochtitlan itself was forced by imperial decree to join the festivities. The emperor would stand at the top of the temple, with his chief advisor and his four most powerful nobles. The drums started playing as the first glimpse of the sun, their god Huitzilopochtli, rose over the horizon. A line of prisoners and slaves would slowly walk up the temple, until it was their turn to come before the priests. There, one by one, their hearts were ripped out of them like an efficient slaughterhouse. It is said that so much blood flowed from the temple that it was completely covered in blood. The people would bring jars and wait at the bottom of the temple for the blood to slowly trickle down, then collect the blood and go home 
to spread the blood on their houses and fields to anoint them in this holy blood. It is said that 80,400 were slaughtered in only five days in a highly choreographed ritual of murder. Many historians think the Aztec exaggerated this number to instill fear in their enemies and put the number closer to 10 or maybe 30,000. Regardless, one can only imagine the horrible smell of a city covered in the rotting blood of their slaves and enemies. Ahuitzol also created colonies around the empire to spread the Aztec culture and to have more direct control over far off territories. Keep in mind that they did not have the wheel for use in transport, so any food and materials would need to be carried on people's backs. The Aztecs believed that almost any other form of transport is lazy. Furthermore, Ahuitzotl declared that any freeborn male must be trained as warriors at the age of 18 to secure Aztec interests. While Ahuitzotl had reformed and centralized the empire quite a bit, it would be too little, too late. For when he died in 1502, the empire was still in great turmoil, despite a string of military victories. They never managed to put down more rebellions than were popping up. These issues would become the problem of his successor, the son of Emperor Aksayakatl, a man named Motokuzuma Xokojotsin, often referred to as simply Motokuzuma II. By the time he comes to power, the Aztec Empire was turned into a vast empire, with lots of trade for the commoners, rebellions and war for the warriors, human sacrifices for the priests, and beautiful metal-crafted ornaments and a corrupt government for the nobles. And despite being corrupt, the Aztec leadership by this point had become well aware that their empire was in trouble, but saw no sustainable way of stopping these issues. We today have historical evidence to point to various alternative economic, social and governmental systems. You could go with the approach the USA used, for example, and simply build colonies on lands of weaker countries and slowly expand that way with a united culture and a strong trade, militaristic and legislative incentives to remain part of the original country. But the Aztecs lived in an isolated area of the world and their collection of historical examples to draw upon used similar systems as the Aztecs. And so the Aztec leadership was forced to invent a new strategy, one they hoped would solve all their problems. Do the same thing they have been doing up until now, but do it even more. From now on, vassals whom the Aztecs thought were loyal were given new lands and privileges. But anyone who was perceived as disloyal would have a large portion of their population taken away for human sacrifices. Far more than previous emperors did, now that they had a new shiny temple to use. Reminding the friends and families of those who were sacrificed, what happens when you rise up against the Aztecs? But as the Aztecs became more violent, the more cities wanted to leave the Aztec Empire, fearing they might have their own hearts ripped out one day. And so more cities rebelled, and as a result, the Aztec became more brutal, hoping that that would quell future rebellions. But instead, this gave ever more credence to the prospect of getting the hell away from these people. And as more rebellions popped up, the emperor became more paranoid. Matakazuma II started seeing enemies everywhere, even if they were still loyal, ordering more brutal retaliations leading to further rebellions, and on and on and on it went. This paranoia can be seen best when a comet appeared in the sky. The Aztecs thought that comets stood for doom and signaled the end of an empire. And Emperor Motokazuma II was deeply disturbed by this sign of the gods. Motokazuma decided to kill all the high priests for failing to predict this comet flying by. Just to give a comparison, imagine if the king of Saudi Arabia decided to murder the entire Sunni Islamic leadership. Or if the Prime Minister of Italy decided to kill the Pope and all the Cardinals in Vatican City. That is how much power this Emperor had, and how large his paranoia had grown. And so we eventually arrive in 1519. The Aztecs have been caught in a spiral of more expansion, more rebellion, and more brutality. 
The Aztec story started as that of the underdog, slowly and steadily becoming the top dog. But then we saw the Aztec going from top dog to a sick dog. A sick dog suffering from its own inability to govern itself in a sustainable way. The Aztec came to a point where their current policies doomed them. But at the same time, it was too late to reverse course. If they became benevolent towards their own subjects, that would likely have been perceived as a sign of weakness, and thus increasing the amount of rebellions instead of reducing them. And so the Aztec Empire could only choose between collapsing and collapsing. And all that was needed was for some event to light the spark that would bring the collapse of the central governing structure of the Empire. And strange reports were just then filtering in to the Emperor. Reports of strange shapes in the sea, of mountains that move across the water. And if you liked this episode, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. My next two videos will finish the Aztec Empire, so if you want to see more of those and other videos as soon as they come out, press the subscribe button. Oh god. <laughs>